The film kicks off with a scene of slaves being taught how to cut sugar cane. A man lounges casually on a wagon loaded with raw cane, observing the labor of his fellow men. The focus then shifts to a cluster of shacks where the slaves gather to eat. Solomon notices the dark juice of blackberries and gets an idea to create ink and a quill. Unfortunately, the plan falls short as the juice proves too thin. Later, in the cramped slave quarters, a woman stirs in her sleep, and Solomon seeks solace using his hand. He reminisces about happier times with his wife and kids, and suddenly, the title card flashes on screen. We catch glimpses of Solomon's life as a free man, skillfully playing the violin and being a sought-after performer in his hometown of Saratoga. That night, after tucking the kids into bed, he chats with his wife, who's about to take the children with her to work as a cook. Playfully expressing jealousy at missing out on her cooking, Solomon bids them farewell as they depart in a carriage. Later that day, he encounters a friend who introduces him to two traveling companions, Brown and Hamilton, associated with a circus-like show. They entice him with an exciting journey to Washington, D.C., promising a swift return before his wife comes back. Intrigued, he agrees to join them. The trio is now at a restaurant in D.C., where patrons generously drop a bag of coins exceeding their promised sum. Wine flows, and one of them closely watches as Solomon finishes his glass. The atmosphere is festive, but suddenly Solomon finds himself in a cramped cell, chained to the floor. In a series of flashbacks, his friends escort him to his hotel room, passing off his drunken state to other onlookers. Brown urges Hamilton that time is of the essence and they need to act quickly. The flashback ends, and we're back with Solomon in the cell. He's informed that he's considered a runaway Georgia slave, despite vehemently asserting his freedom without papers. Solomon endures a merciless beating and is eventually placed in a slave pen with others. Clemens, an educated slave, enlightens him on the dire nature of their situation. Soon, a mother named Eliza and her daughter join a previously captured son in the pen. Despite her attempts to maintain a brave face, Eliza understands the tragedy that awaits them. Under the cover of darkness, they are extracted from their cell, chained and transported to a riverboat. Led to the hold, crammed with other human cargo, Clemens emphasizes the importance of Solomon maintaining a low profile, denying his ability to read and write. Another slave, Robert, expresses a desire to revolt and take over the ship. The group contemplates their odds before opting for caution. Later that night, a slaver visits the hold and awakens Eliza with the intent to rape her. Robert tries to intervene but is fatally stabbed. Clemens and Solomon are tasked with disposing of Robert's body in the river. Clemens coldly remarks that Robert is better off dead. They arrive at a dock where Clement's master awaits, demanding the return of his stolen property. Clemens eagerly descends to his master, abandoning any previous display of intellect. Solomon mourns the loss of his only friend. Upon disembarking, a slaver named Freeman calls his new slaves to their feet by announcing their names. Solomon is called Platt, a name he doesn't recognize, and is slapped for denying it. The dehumanizing nature of Freeman's slave operation is evident as the naked slaves bathe in buckets at his offices. Inside, Freeman puts on a sales pitch for eager customers. A genteel plantation owner, Ford, expresses interest in Platt, Solomon, and Eliza. She pleads for Ford to take her children as well, but Freeman swiftly sells her son to another buyer. Ford attempts to buy her daughter, who is clearly of mixed heritage, but Freeman refuses to adjust his price. Ford can only afford to purchase Solomon and Eliza. Eliza, devastated, screams in grief, disrupting the sale. Solomon is then commanded to play the fiddle to lighten the mood. Ford transports his newly acquired slaves back to his plantation. Eliza continues sobbing throughout the journey. Ford's wife suggests that food and a night's rest might help her forget the pain of separation from her children. The following morning, the slaves are introduced to Tibbets, a slave handler, and Ford's overseer, Chaplin. 
Tibbets mockingly sings a warning song to discourage slaves from attempting escape as they carry out their labor, chopping timber. During their work, they encounter a small band of native people, and for a brief moment, they share a respite. Solomon notices a stringed instrument among the natives, triggering memories of his own violin. Against Clemens's advice, Solomon approaches Ford with an idea to transport lumber via the river. Tibbets is condescending, but Ford is impressed with Solomon's proposal and gives it the green light. The plan succeeds, humiliating Tibbets. As a reward, Ford offers Solomon a violin to play. Meanwhile, back at the slave quarters, Eliza mourns the loss of her children, and Solomon, frustrated by the noise, debates with her about surviving under Ford's seemingly decent treatment. Eliza argues that Ford must realize Solomon is not a slave, but does nothing to free him. Solomon is left contemplating this realization. Eventually, Eliza is sold off because Ford's wife can't bear the constant sorrow. Over the next few days, Tibbets tries to exact petty vengeance on Solomon, leading to a verbal confrontation. Tibbets attempts to beat Solomon, who fights back and gains the upper hand. Chaplin arrives on the scene, sending Tibbets fleeing. He warns Solomon that he cannot protect him if he runs, hinting that he will inform Ford to resolve the matter. Later, Tibbets gathers a group of thugs to lynch Solomon for daring to fight him. They place a noose around his neck, ready to hang him when Chaplin returns with guns drawn. He chases off the thugs but leaves Solomon hanging there as a form of punishment, barely able to support his weight on tiptoes. Slowly, slaves emerge from their cabins, seemingly indifferent to his plight. A woman discreetly brings him some water, but quickly retreats. Hours later, Ford finally returns and cuts the rope, saving Solomon. He drags him into the house for protection, but decides that he must be sold, as Tibbets is relentless in seeking vengeance. It's revealed that Ford has sold Solomon to a notorious plantation owner named Epps, known for his brutal beatings. Epps reads a Bible passage, distorting the scripture to reinforce his belief in owning slaves. The next day brings a cotton-picking task. At day's end, the weight of each worker's bundles is measured. Solomon's yield is below average, and slaves who pick less than the previous day receive lashes. Meanwhile, Patsy consistently surpasses the production of any other worker by nearly double. Epps hovers around Patsy, offering excessive praise, clearly fascinated by her. His wife, however, is far from pleased with the attention he lavishes on Patsy. Epps enters the slave quarters, awakening them from sleep and orchestrating an impromptu dance where Patsy is the center of attention. In a fit of jealousy, Mistress Epps hurls a heavy crystal decanter at Patsy's face, leaving her brutally scarred. She insists that Epps sell Patsy, but he defiantly claims he would send his wife away before parting with Patsy. Mistress Epps then sends Solomon on an errand to the store, handing him a list and warning him not to read it. On his way to the store, Solomon contemplates escape and inadvertently stumbles upon a lynching. Witnessing the grim fate of the two men, his spirit is shattered, and he continues to the store. Upon seeing the paper, he conceives the idea to carry a small scrap with him each time, gradually building a letter. Sometime later, Epps sends Solomon to a nearby plantation owned by Shaw. Shaw has married one of his slaves, elevating her status, at least within his plantation. Patsy is there for a visit, reveling in the luxurious surroundings. However, it becomes apparent that Epps is jealous that Shaw might provide Patsy with a better life. After a brief refreshment, Solomon persuades Patsy to accompany him back to Epps's plantation. Upon their return, Epps is visibly drunk. Solomon discreetly advises Patsy to avoid Epps, but Epps misinterprets it as Solomon making a sexual advance. A drunken chase ensues around the yard, attracting attention. Mistress Shaw intervenes, not to defend Patsy, but to express her disgust at her husband's obsession with her. Later that night, Epps, in his inebriated state, stumbles to the slave quarters and rapes Patsy. Later that night, Patsy implores Solomon to strangle her and dispose of her body, unable to endure Epps' rapes and his wife's torment any longer. 
Despite her desperate pleas, Solomon refuses. In the following days, Epps' cotton crops suffer from a devastating insect infestation. With two harvests lost, Epps decides to lend his slaves to a judge, hoping to derive some benefit and pay off the mortgage on their purchases. This takes us back to the opening scene, where Solomon is cutting sugarcane. The judge observes Solomon's skill and recommends him to a neighbor in need of music for a party. As an added bonus, the judge allows Solomon to keep whatever wages he earns. The party is an elaborate costume affair, and Solomon keenly recognizes parallels between his past life as a free man and his current forced servitude. The festivities come to an end, and it's time to return to Epps' farm. As Solomon approaches the house, he notices Patsy's bloodied eye, a clear indication that her torments have continued. The cotton crop is harvested, signaling a return to the fields for the enslaved workers. This time, they are joined by a white laborer, Armsby, who is picking to earn money and get back on his feet. Despite his significantly lower yield compared to other workers, he is spared the whipping that the other slaves endure. In the quarters, Armsby tends to Solomon's wounds and shares a story, presenting himself as a seemingly decent man and a sympathetic listener. Solomon, desperate for a way out, decides to risk trusting Armsby with the task of sending a letter north in the hopes of securing his freedom. He hands over all his earnings from the party and makes Armsby swear to keep it a secret. Solomon plans to collect the letter in two days. However, that very night, Epps enters the quarters and takes Solomon outside. Armsby has broken his word and revealed everything to Epps. Fortunately, he spoke before Solomon handed him the letter. Quick on his feet and playing on Epps' low opinion of slaves, Solomon turns the story around on Armsby. He portrays him as a liar trying to gain favor and employment. This narrative convinces Epps, and Solomon is spared punishment. Later, Solomon burns the letter, watching his hopes of freedom turn to ashes. Sometime later, a team of workers is seen building a structure with a hired hand named Bass. Bass hails from the North and holds strong abolitionist views that starkly contrast with Epps's fervent pro-slavery stance. The discussions between them captivate Solomon's interest. Later, Epps is in a frenzy over Patsy's disappearance, believing she has run away. He threatens all the women with violence in response to her loss. However, Patsy has simply gone back to Shaw's plantation to visit her friend. Upon her return, she tries to convince Epps that she is faithful to him and went to get some soap, a luxury denied to her by Epps's wife. She loudly asserts her worth, insisting that she deserves to be clean. Epps, driven to the edge by his wife's incessant bickering, calls for Patsy to be tied to the whipping post. As he prepares to strike, he finds himself unable to carry out the punishment. Perversely, he demands that Solomon be the one to administer the lashes. Initially, Solomon tries to be gentle, but Mistress Epps sees through the attempt and encourages her husband to escalate the severity of the whipping. Epps, fueled by rage, points a gun at Solomon's head, threatening to kill every slave he sees unless Solomon whips Patsy harder. Faced with an unthinkable choice, Solomon reluctantly intensifies the whipping, each strike accompanied by a pink mist of blood. After a brief pause, Epps, consumed by anger, takes over and lashes Patsy himself. The merciless punishment tears her flesh to shreds, and she collapses. Solomon finds himself alone with Bass, the hired hand. Curious, Solomon asks where Bass is from, and when he replies, Canada, Solomon demonstrates convincing knowledge of the country. Bass wonders how Solomon is so well-traveled, and Solomon reveals the harrowing tale of his circumstances. Bass comes to believe Solomon's story, understanding the profound injustice of it. As they continue their work, Solomon takes a chance and asks Bass if he can write letters to his friends in Saratoga. Bass, moved by the injustice he witnesses, agrees to help. Then, as the work is completed, Bass departs, leaving Solomon behind. A long shot lingers on Solomon, uncertainty evident in his eyes. He has no idea whether Bass has kept his word, 
and the passage of time leaves him wondering if he has been betrayed once again. Tears well in Solomon's eyes, hinting at the possibility of another disappointment. Now a group of men are seen tilling the soil and planting seeds. A carriage arrives at Epps's plantation, and an official-looking man calls out for Platt, Solomon. He responds and approaches the man, who turns out to be a sheriff. The sheriff asks him questions and signals to another man in the carriage. It is Mr. Parker, a shop owner from Saratoga and a friend of Solomon's. With little further prompting, the sheriff is convinced, and Solomon rushes to embrace his friend. Epps is incensed, yelling empty threats as the sheriff dismisses his arguments. Parker assists Solomon into the carriage that will take him to safety. Patsy is there, calling out to him. Solomon leaps from the carriage to embrace her one last time before his departure. As he leaves, Patsy collapses in grief. Now Solomon has been carried home. Outside his door, he seems overwhelmed, having been delivered from his nightmare. Upon entering, he is greeted by his family, now 12 years older but overjoyed to see him. His daughter has married and named their son Solomon Northup. Tears flow as they gather around him, welcoming him home.